Hi, everyone, and welcome to Your Healthy Dose. It's a podcast about current trends in healthcare, and I'm your host, Kim Douglas. Today, we're going to talk with a doctor that we typically don't think too much about when it comes to treatment, but plays an enormous role in keeping us alive. They take care of us from when we're newborns all the way through to our geriatric years. With me today, I have Dr. Neil Shaw, who is an anesthesiologist at St. John's. Welcome, Dr. Shaw, and thank thank you for for being here with us. My pleasure. So as an anesthesiologist, you think of yourself as a perioperative physician. Mm -hmm. Describe exactly what that means. Sure. So before surgery, during surgery, and after surgery is what we describe as a perioperative time frame and perioperative physician. So before surgery, we are working with all of the subspecialists who are involved in your care. So if you have a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, an internal medicine doctor, whatever it may be, we make sure that those organ systems are optimized, your medications are where they should be, um, you know, everything is in check, and the appropriate testing has been done. Then it comes to intraoperative management. You know, and a lot of times people don't always understand that anesthesia is not just simply putting you to sleep and waking you up. You know, I think it's more appropriate to think of it as almost as critical care medicine in the operating room, in addition to making sure you're asleep and comfortable. And then lastly, we also take care of patients after the operating room too. So when you first arrive in the recovery room, the PACU, we are there to uh, monitor you, make sure your respiratory status, your vitals are okay. And then if you are critically ill and you transition to the ICU, the intensive care unit, um, oftentimes it's an anesthesiologist there who is the intensivist and is taking care of you there as well. So our role begins before, during, and both after surgery. You're just about everywhere, aren't you? So oftentimes you're called to the emergency room, I understand. Mm -hmm. So why are anesthesiologists considered airway experts? Sure. So um, much of our training is involved with airway management. So we, we, we study the airway anatomy and we train in using all the different devices that are used to manage your airway. Okay, so if, if, you know, you don't often always realize realize it, but uh, once you go to sleep, you know, the anesthesiologist will put in a breathing tube. We call it an endotracheal tube. And it's not always very straightforward to to put that breathing tube where it needs to be. And so we have lots of uh, equipment and devices, cameras, bronchoscopes, things like that, laryngoscopes that we use to place the breathing tube in the correct location. But then we also have other devices where, let's say you've been in a trauma or a facial burn or you have some type of congenital anomaly in your larynx or face, then putting the breathing tube in is not always straightforward. And so our emergency medicine colleagues will oftentimes call us in consultation to come down to the emergency room and help them manage that aspect of it. But then the next part of it is once you have a way to uh, secure an airway, then it's also managing the ventilator. You know, what type of respiratory parameters you want to use, and that's also part of our, our training. And so I think... Airway management is a, a lot of what we do, and we're generally considered the, the experts in the, in the hospital, and sure. so we'll get called to assist. That makes so much sense. And, you know, I kind of think of you as like the magicians almost, because <laughs> when you guys come in, you know, you just kind of give us a little shot and say, oh, you're, now you're going to go to sleep. And I never realized half the time that I had that in the mm-hmm. breathing tube. But when you wake up, I think we all can relate that we have a little bit of a dry throat. Yeah, so definitely. you are kind of a little magician kind of doing these things that we yeah. don't even realize. Now, um, Moving into pain management. So it's another key factor for the anesthesiologist. How do you help with acute pain? Sure. So there's um, the acute pain of surgery, which is the, a lot of what we do. So there's a large push in society and in, in healthcare to reduce opioid consumption. You know, traditionally, you have pain before, during, and after surgery. You, you take a narcotic, an opioid. Um, But it's not necessarily ideal. You know, there's addiction issues. um, They can cause respiratory depression, have other side effects like nausea and constipation. So they're not necessarily a perfect modality, but they're still a a large part of our armamentarium. But the other things that we do is we use other classes of drugs to control pain, um, and they're not necessarily opioids. So, for an example, like non-steroidal drugs like Celebrex or something um, like even ketamine. Ketamine is coming into, you know, the back into the vernacular again. The other thing that we try and do as much as possible is use regional anesthetic techniques. Okay, so I'll give you an example. If you're having a a knee replacement at St. John's, 
we will most often do the, your, the base of your anesthetic with a spinal anesthetic. So that's an injection of medications around the spinal cord and that blocks out the nerve roots to the lower part of your body. And you could actually have the surgery just with that, okay? For, uh, women do that when they have a C-section. But most patients, you know, they want to listen to the sawing and the cutting, and so we give a mild sedation on top of that. But they don't have to have a breathing tube. They don't have to be on a ventilator. We keep them breathing just simply spontaneously with an oxygen mask. So that's uh, a, a great technique, and we, um, that's how we, I would say do 90% of our joint replacements is that way. But then the other things that we can do to help uh, with pain control intraoperatively and postoperatively, we use uh, different types of pain pumps. Okay, we'll actually use an ultrasound machine, and we'll visualize the nerves in and around your knee, and we'll inject local anesthetic next to those nerves, and then we'll in, uh, bury a catheter, which goes through the skin and through the muscle, and will actually sit next to the nerve and come out of the body and be attached to a round ball, which is a pain pump, and you'll get an infusion for you know, sometimes up to five days, and the patients go home with those. And that's been a real game changer because you're more comfortable. And when you're more comfortable, you know, you do your physical therapy uh, more aggressively. You'll need less narcotics and the sedation and potential for falls and everything else that comes with that. So pain management is a large aspect of what we're doing intraoperatively, postoperatively. Absolutely. What about chronic pain? Yeah, so we also treat chronic pain as well. So one of the subspecialties in after anesthesia that you can go into is acute and chronic pain management. So if you see a pain management specialist, they can treat you for medically or right, using medications to treat pain. But then there's a lot of things that they do otherwise. So if you have back problems, for example, sometimes people get are getting like steroid injections in their back or nerve ablations in their back. Um, there can be chronic pain, let's say, related to cancer. Okay, cancer patients, oftentimes if some of the viscera organs in your abdomen or pelvis, um, the nerves are compressed from the tumors. And so you'll have a pain management specialist um, using u- ultrasound or x-ray guidance actually thread needles down to those nerve roots and inject either ablative agents or local anesthetics or steroids to try and reduce the inflammation or nerve transmission at that level to treat your pain. So that's a, one of the subspecialties that you, you can go into is, is Wow, pain management. I have no idea. And that's mm-hmm. so, I mean, that just affects your entire quality of life mm-hmm. if you've got chronic pain. I had no idea that the anesthesiologist can be so important a part of that as well. So now we're going to just kind of move into anesthesia throughout the years. Since you handle patients from birth until death, tell us what types of treatments we might expect through the different stages of life. Sure, of course. Um, I think one of the most joyous parts of what we do is in the labor and delivery uh, ward. You know, it's it's, it's a great time of, uh, in any family to have that newborn coming in. And so we take care of the mom, and oftentimes that involves a labor epidural. So it makes that process much more comfortable and, and, and pleasant. You know, you, you can always tell which room has a patient that has an epidural and doesn't based on the screaming, right, and the nurse's tears. Huh. So uh, labor epidurals are, are very fulfilling because, honestly, the, the mom is in so much pain, and we come in and we place the epidural, and within minutes they feel better. Um, and so, you know, that same epidural, which is basically a, a catheter that sits in front of the spinal cord, uh, we can actually use it in case they have to have a, a C-section in an emergency. You know, sometimes if the baby's not doing well or mom's not doing well, they have to crash into the operating room and have a C-section. So we can use that same epidural catheter to, to take care of them. Um, sometimes you can't, you have to put them under general anesthetic, but the majority of the time, if they have an epidural in place, we can use it for a C-section as well. And the other part that comes through there is also when you have a newborn. Okay, sometimes when the newborn is uh, in duress and they need help, both you know, if their blood pressure is not where it needs to be, if they're not breathing, um, you know, the anesthesiologist and the neonatologist, uh, there'll be a respiratory therapist sometimes in the NICU, will all work together to resuscitate that baby and take care of that child. So that um, that is the earliest interaction that we have. Yeah. And then, you know, you have anesthesiologists who specialize in pediatric anesthesia. So it's a fellowship after training in general anesthesia. And they do everything from tiny little neonates that are the size of the palm of your hand. And, and, and they generally considered, you know, maybe up to 10, 11, 12 years old. And if, you, if your child has congenital anomalies and need really subspecialized care, uh, you'll have someone who has studied that and has a lot of additional training. Um, And then we move through the years, you know, from adolescence through adults uh, and all the surgeries in between. And, uh, you know, and then eventually as we age, you know, all the different surgeries that we have uh, at the later part of our life. So 
it's a uh, it's very rewarding to me, and I think to anyone who goes to this field that you get to be involved in such a broad spectrum of patients. You know, it's not many of the specialties that get to do that. So. Exactly, like you say, from birth till geriatric. And when you are talking about ages sixty five and up, mm-hmm. I'm sure you have a different type of treatment. How do you deal with that? Well. Um, for older patients, it's not necessarily age, oh. but it is oftentimes um, the comorbidities of your health as you age. Okay, there are people who are 65 and are more fit than, than you or I, and then there are people who are not. And so what we th- what we try and do is we try and tailor the anesthetic to minimize exposure to anesthesia, if that makes sense. And so, you know, some, the very common things you have in that age group are obviously arthritis, so joint replacements. You oftentimes have heart disease, so, you know, you need open heart surgery or, or you know, in the cath lab. But anytime we're taking care of those patients, our emphasis is, and with any patient, but more so in that is trying to decrease exposure to the anesthetics because the higher the dosages, you, know, you get more uh, variability in blood pressure and oxygen levels and your heart rhythm and things like that. And so, you know, we have a lot of v- new developments in technology that will help us to do that. An example of one is uh, we have a device we put on the patient's forehead and we can actually analyze their brainwave pattern in real time. And so you can really, really tailor the dosages of the anesthetics and not be afraid that you're underdosing them or overdosing them. You know, traditionally it's kind of based on age and on weight, somewhat on race of how we dose the anesthetics. You know, and we we look at their vitals. You know, if their blood pressure is too high or or uh, their heart rate's too high, oftentimes you may think, okay, there's not enough anesthetic on board. But that's not always the case. Um, so this 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 technology really allows us to tailor that anesthetic perfectly, and it has been, I, I think, a real game changer. Some of those things we talked about in terms of the peripheral nerve blocks and the spinals, you know, we really try and emphasize that too as much as possible um, for our older patients because I think they bounce back cognitively much quicker, you know, kind of that fogginess that you just don't feel exactly right, you know. And then the other thing is the types of anesthetic drugs. You know, some of the intravenous drugs are, are shorter acting, metabolize more quickly in their system. And so especially older patients tend to wake up smoother and quicker. Wow. Well, there, there you go. There's something mm-hmm. positive about that, right? Mm-hmm. So how does the future look then? Let's move forward. Sure. What types of technology is in development to improve anesthesia? Sure. So, you know, anesthesia has become much, much safer uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. You know, if you look at statistically the advent of a couple of two different devices, one is called a pulse oximeter. Yeah. It's a device that, you know, you can put typically on your finger, but it can be another places in the body where you have access to capillary beds, and it measures the amount of oxygen bound to your red blood cells. So we call that pulse oximetry. And if you go back 30 years before, the only, the, the really only way to monitor it is the anesthesiologist looking at the body and looking if your lips were kind of turning purple or your mucosa were changing color, signs of hypoxia. Not always a perfect science. So this particular technology has made anesthesia much, much safer. Uh, there's another... Uh, monitoring technique that we use, which is called capnography. And what that is, is it's monitoring how much uh, carbon dioxide you breathe out. Because when you have gas exchange in your lungs, you know, you're breathing oxygen in and CO2 is a waste product. So if we, if you, if that device sees that there's CO2 coming out through the breathing tube or just from your, your nose or your mouth, then we know that you have gas exchange, you're breathing appropriately. And so that has made anesthesia much, much, much safer. Um, so those are those are two devices that yeah, are now commonplace. And in fact, you know, it's below the standard of care if you don't use them while you're giving anesthesia. The some of, there's a lot of advancements now in uh, pain management. Okay, we talked about some of the, that pain pump, that implantable pain pump. Um, there's new types of uh, kind of dissolvable patches, essentially that we have the surgeon put within the incision, and it will slowly over time dissolve and release a local anesthetic or a local infl- or an anti-inflammatory or both over time. And that's that's really a game changer in terms of reducing opioid consumption and just being more comfortable. Um, we have a lot of device, invasive devices that we use for sicker patients, um, you know, where they actually go into the heart and they'll monitor how the heart is pumping and how much, uh, you know, your volume status in your heart and uh, what the blood levels are. And so they, they really make taking care of critically ill patients uh, much safer and we can kind of do it in real time. So I think there's advancements in pharmacology. There's advancements in these regional techniques and these pain pumps. Uh, there's advancements in some of the devices that we use, the specialized equipment that we can use to safely put in the breathing tube or in cases where it's, uh, you know, abnormal anatomy or trauma that help us to do that. So... 
all of these technologies together make our field safer. Yes. Um, and, you know, advancement, advancements in surgery too, surgical techniques, surgical devices, you know, you have to tailor the anesthetic and the monitoring to that. An example is robotic surgery, which we do a lot of at St. John's, right? And so we've had to adapt and it's, it's made surgery safer and more comfortable for our patients. Amazing. Now, there is a big push to move away from volatile anesthetics the gases that you breathe in and more towards the intravenous mm -hmm. type. So why is that? And what is your feeling on that? Sure. So traditionally, um, it was, you know, if you go back 100 years, it was ether or derivatives of it, which were kind of the first uh, anesthetics that were used. And there was a, those were basically just kind of dripped over your face with a, with a mask very in, inaccurately by anesthesiologists to kind of put you asleep. And so it, it's developed over the years to other types of inhaled gases. Uh, and then now it's progressing towards intravenous uh, anesthetics. So the reason that's been a real game changer is twofold. Number one, the side effect profile of the intravenous drugs is much better. A very common one that most people have heard of is propofol. Okay, And yes. it, it's kind of had a bad reputation because of what happened with uh, Michael Jackson. But right. it's a very safe drug. It's been used in the operating room for many, many years. It's just, you know, it's too potent to use at home. Right. So other intravenous drugs, in addition to propofol, we've been pushing towards because of their side effect profile. Um, they, their onset is very quick. Their offset in terms of how your body metabolize and metabolizes them is faster. The side effect profile is better. The other part of it is environmental, believe it or not. So the, uh, the volatile anesthetics, the gases, um, there's a, in part of the breathing circuit that you use, there's a chemical reaction that absorbs those gases and the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out. And the byproducts uh, is, is carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. So if you look at the carbon footprint, which is a big buzzword uh, nowadays, it's actually very high. So, you know, there's there's data that shows that, you know, you can have a long anesthetic under volatile gases can have the same carbon footprint as driving a four-cylinder car a thousand miles. Away. Oh, my goodness. So if you multiply that times the millions of anesthetics that are given around the world, uh, you know, the carbon footprint that we could reduce by using less of the gases is tremendous. And so that's the... Uh, you know, a newer push and within our society to, to address that issue. Definitely. Um, let's talk about you. Okay. Um, how did you just get into this field? Yeah, well, you know, my, my route to becoming a physician was kind of a circular one. You know, I was an, uh, an engineer in undergrad, but then my first job, I worked for a pharmaceutical company and I worked in finance. So I was part of business development and kind of a product acquisition team. So I, I had a very different background. Most people go through undergrad, go straight to med school, and, mm -hmm. but I, I did that for three years. And, you know, I, I, I kind of I wanted to be a physician, but I wasn't necessarily sure I wanted to practice clinical medicine. You know, as a, as a, as a physician, there's a lot of different things you can do. You know, you can work in banking, you can work in drug trials, you can work in regulatory affairs, you can do patient care, you can do hospital administration or even insurance administration, things like that. So I thought, originally that my um, my goal was to work in kind of healthcare banking or something in that field. But actually my wife, Shanti, she, she pushed me. She goes, look, you know, I think you have uh, a knack for it and a passion and it's a, it's a great field. You take care of patients, you know, you have a very pivotal role in their, in their lives. So she kind of pushed me into becoming a clinician, a physician. And that's how I transitioned from the pharmaceutical industry into being a, a doctor. And then once in medical school, you know, you do rotations and lots of the different subspecialties and, you know, you make decisions on many different factors. But um, for me, you know, just my, my passion and my skill set, I, I always loved being an anesthesiologist. And I loved the uh, variety of types of surgeries you could be involved in. And what I mean by that is, okay, you know, let's say you're an orthopedic surgeon. You're going to do joint replacements all day long, right? And that's all you do. But if you're an anesthesiologist, you know, I can do anesthesia for orthopedic surgery, for neurosurgery, for pediatrics, for labor and delivery. And so I get to be involved in so many different aspects of healthcare and uh, the whole continuum of the patient's life. And so that really appealed to me. And then I think, you know, you just take, you kind of have to have a certain uh, personality trait to be an anesthesiologist. You know, you kind of have to be kind of cool under fire. You have to be comfortable with kind of just being in the background, but when things go south, becoming the captain of the ship very quickly and taking over that team in the OR and um, doing it in a controlled manner, but being assertive and confident and knowing what to do because everyone is there looking to you for guidance and 
So you just have to take a deep, hard look at what makes you tick and if that you really built that way. And, yeah. you, and you find out pretty quickly when you start doing rotations in the different fields. And so I just I felt for me it was a good fit. So, and I'm, I feel very happy with my career choice now. Exactly. And we talked earlier about how you really are the first level in going into that surgery. And as a patient, looking at you and getting your confidence and the way you are, you're very calm. I'm sure it puts the patient at ease. So um, hopefully I won't need any surgery, but if I do, I hope you're the first person I see. Thank you. So before we close, I just want to ask you if there's anything that you want to share with our viewers and our listeners as a parting note. Sure, sure. I, I think that uh, it's there's a whole team that takes care of you in the operating room, and it involves nurses, surgical techs, surgeons, anesthesiologists, and we all work together and all have our own role. Mm -hmm. But I think that one of the things that gives a lot of people anxiety is going under, being under anesthesia and kind of giving over control of your body to somebody else. And I just want you to know that as a patient, that anesthesiologist has many, many years of training. You know, it's 12 to 13 years of training to get to that point after high school. Um, and they are there for you, number one. And, and I think people think of anesthesia as someone who puts you to sleep and someone who wakes you up, but the real, honestly, jo job description is vigilance. You are supposed to keep track of everything that's happening in that surgical field. Is there bleeding? Is there something going on with the equipment? You're keeping track of the patient's vitals and you're keeping track of um, everything that's happening in that perioperative process. So your anesthesiologist is there as kind of, I want to say as your guardian angel, they're looking down and, and they're making sure that you're safe, that you're comfortable, that you're asleep. And they're there to, you know, to help you. And if you ever have, you know, questions or concerns, you know, most of the time you don't get to meet us until in the pre-op area, right? Sometimes we can't arrange for it, but oftentimes the way our healthcare system is, that's when you meet us for the first time. And so in a very short amount of time, we have to instill confidence in you to trust us and we take that role very seriously, um, and we are there uh, to guide you through the whole process and keep you safe. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for being here with us today. This is about all the time we have. But will you be sure to tell Dr. Shaw to your wife that we send our best? I will. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for joining us here today. And we also want to thank St. John's Health Center Foundation for making this podcast possible. So for all of you joining us today, we want to have your healthcare questions sent to your healthy dose podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Kim Douglas with your healthy dose. <music>